participate by making our own sound. We can just use our own own masks just for a few minutes. Melchizedek um, called the prince or the king of peace. To introduce some things about the Bible, we in a weekend we can only become just familiar with the Bible. We can't do a lot of intensive Bible study, but there are some things that I'd like you to know about it just um, for familiarity. The first thing I'd like to mention is that it it's a bit of a shame for us, or it feels perhaps like it's a shame, that in about uh, 350 AD, there was a council at Constantinople. It was called because the Roman Empire had embraced Christianity. But Christianity at that time was still full of Jewish customs and beliefs. And this was an interesting problem for Rome because they did not want to adopt throughout the whole Roman Empire uh, a provincial religion, but yet that's what they were faced with. Uh, as Justinian became a Christian, um, a term that was started in the Greek world, uh, a chain of events happened there that sort of removes us from the Bible as it was originally presented. Meaning this, of course, the Bible was written in Hebrew the first time that it was written. But when Justinian uh, took on the Christian faith, he tried to make it a more universal faith by taking out all of the Hebrew idioms, the Hebrew beliefs and practices, such as um, the uh, the Hebrew form of baptism, which John had used in the Jordan. Um, the belief in reincarnation, which had been uh, a tradition among the Jews, a very, very well-known tradition. He took those things out in order to make this a universal religion. And of course, he changed the Hebrew names of most things, including the apostles, into Greek names. So as you have grown up learning about Jesus Christ and the apostles, you've grown up learning about a man with a Greek name, removing you from touching his real name that he lived with in his lifetime and that he was identified with. So when you read about the apostles, you're not reading any of their real names. They're just not in the Bible. They're not there. They have to be translated back again. Now, that's not true of the Old Testament. 
thank goodness he did not change all of the names of the places and the names of the people of the Old Testament. If he had, we would have even more trouble than we have today finding out what the Bible has to say. It has a lot to say that you won't get in English and you won't get in Greek because all of those Hebrew names have meanings. Um, we'll talk about the importance of some of those meanings as we go along a little further. But first, I just want you to know that it was de-Hebrewized and changed into a Greek religion um, in an attempt to make it a more universal religion. So they took it away the name of the rabbi who had taught Judaism so perfectly that in his mind he want, wanted to accomplish what Judaism was all about. And from his own words and his own statements he had no intention of starting a new religion. There was not some new religion to replace Judaism. Um, Judaism as far as he was concerned was already quite universal and it was. It grew as a universal religion. Um, we can show that particularly in this way. In the ancient time, uh, the time of Abraham and before, there was a kind of a, a code among the mystery schools of the countries of that day. And when we speak of mystery schools, uh, we should mention it in this way. Every nation that considered itself a nation, everyone that considered itself to be um, an entity, a sovereign country, every nation had its religious tradition, and its traditions were the power of the faith of that people. And the words of power and the elements of power, the rituals of power, were kept sacred within that sovereign country. And that was the mystery tradition of that country. And it was a mystery, of course, because they didn't pass on those words of power to their neighbors in a different country. They believed that those words were powerful enough that they protected their country and they were very sacred to that specific group of people. But the, uh, the Jews did an interesting thing in playing out their drama. When I say playing out their drama, I want to explain it this way. <clears throat> it, there's very good evidence among scholars looking at the way history has unfolded. There's good evidence for a, a plan a grand plan that calls for both people and nations to play specific roles in order for history to unfold in a way that a person just watching this interaction of God and man, just reading history, would see a lot of things revealed about God in the way that people live their lives. And so the Jews, who sometime later called themselves the chosen people, lived their life in such a way that it would bring together the mystery schools literally all over the world. And one way that that was accomplished was that this tiny nation, which started out without any land of their own, they didn't have a homeland, they didn't have a nation really, they started with a patriarch, a father, who was the son of a Chaldean initiate. Um, but this Chaldean initiate, maybe this is the first person that we want to know about. His name is Terah. Terah is the father of Abraham, and he is identified in the Bible as a temple builder. And that expression, temple builder, is extremely important to us when we know that in the mystery schools of the Chaldeans, the Greeks, the Egyptians, um, and the uh, what we now call the Indians, um, in all of these traditions, an initiate proved that he was an initiate by knowing the proper sacred geometry for 
correctly building the proportions of a temple. In every one of these countries, uh, whatever country you want to go to right around the world, whether it's this hemisphere or um, the Asian continent, you'll find the same thing happening here, that these temples are built to the proportions of man's body. Because the belief was that man is the grand symbol or archetype that has perfect proportions. Um, that cause man to respond to something that is built to the proportions of his body. Because whatever that thing is built to the same proportions as his body will have relative chakra centers. And the temples were places where the sacred chakras were stimulated by walking through the, um, the designs of the temple. So the temple builders had to be initiates in order to know how to build the proportions of the temple. That lets us know that Terra was a temple builder. We also know what kind of temple Terra built. It was um, a kind of a pyramid that had ramps going from one level to the other level, down again. One could climb these ramps in seven stages to come to the top of this kind of temple. So this temple with the ramp going this way, that way, this way, and so on, was a seven-stage temple, the uppermost dedicated to the moon and the base to the sun and the other planets, uh, or the planets, uh, I should say, in between. So this kind of temple is called a ziggurat. And Abraham's father was a builder of the ziggurat, and he knew the powers of initiation of the moon. And the Chaldean belief here was that the moon, of course, controls the tides, the cycles of women, uh, the growth of plants, the fertilization of seeds. They knew that with the moon cycles, waters rise up and subside. So they had very obvious proof of the power of the moon over their lives. They were also very concerned with dreams and dream interpretation, and, and this is also the area of the moon. The Egyptian initiatic mysteries in their mystery school built temples to the sun, uh, which they called Ra. And the sun god Ra also had ample evidence in Egypt of the fact that Ra, the sun, gives all life. And without the light of the sun, life cannot exist on this planet. So we have two things, the moon and the sun here, and their interaction between Chaldea and Egypt. And the interesting thing is that these mystery schools worked together in a very unique way. If you were in Chaldea, you could not become an initiate of the moon god unless you were discovered, chosen. You could not apply to enter a mystery school. You couldn't fill out a form and, and pass a test and, and whatever and go and attend the school. If you were a dreamer or a mystic, a visionary, and an initiate of this temple happened to discover you in the countryside, then he initiated you and brought you to grow up in the temple and literally from your very earliest days, still nursing, you would be brought up to be a temple initiate. So their secrets were guarded very closely because they didn't want their neighbors to know how to invoke the power of the moon. But that would be the power of the tides, that would be the power of blood. They knew on what night they wanted to attack an enemy, if, if we come down to being this exact about it, they knew that at the time of the full moon, 
if they attack an enemy, he's going to hemorrhage considerably more than if they attacked him on the waning moon. Um, that's to put it into a military focus. And it has all kinds of applications from military to the power of guidance through dreams. They, they were reluctant to give up these secrets. However, they did share secrets among initiates because they knew that an initiate of Chaldea or an initiate of Egypt, either one, was a person whose lips are sealed. They don't give away their power. But if the, uh, the king of Chaldea wants to know the Egyptian secrets, the power of the sun, then he can send a Chaldean initiate to study in Egypt, but this Chaldean initiate will not use the mysteries of Egypt's mystery schools against Egypt. So alliances were formed and there were men who gathered the information from several different mystery schools of different countries to become a full initiate. One way that that story is told is to say that, uh, that Abraham, um, a man whose name at first was either Ab or Abba or Abbas, all three of those words are words that mean the father or Abbas means son of the father. This young man, Abba, is sent, after he becomes a Chaldean initiate, he is sent to Egypt with a request from his father, Terah, that the mystery schools of Egypt will initiate him into the knowledge of Ra. And of course, when he was initiated, then they added that syllable to his name and he became Abram. But then, between Chaldea and Egypt, Abram comes to a desert place. Now, the term desert place here is extremely important to us, so we want to remember this term. This is going to become a part of your glossary for understanding the Bible. A desert is a place without features, either man-made or God-made features. So we'll say, for example, that a city is a man-made feature on the environment, a city with walls. A mountain is a God-made structure, a feature of the landscape. Valleys, high places, low places, all of this. What you want to remember when you read the Bible is that uh, geographical locations or elevations of land or uh, landscape features are mentioned in the Bible more than 20,000 times. Now if you think about that, it's just not necessary to fill a book full of descriptions of he was in the valley, he was on the mountain, he was in the woods, he was by the river, unless that has meaning. So obviously there's a reason why they have filled this book with geographical features. And one of the reasons we find, just when we find Abram in a desert place, after having been initiated to the Zigurat and to the pyramid, he comes to a place where neither of them exists, a desert. Nothing there, flat, open. And the way you want to read that is, Abram, after being an initiate of all of this wisdom, came to a place of not knowing, empty, open mind, no opinions, no features, no fixed things in his mind. And in the desert, then he said, just surrounded, just with plain open desert, he said, I know the power of the God of the moon, I know the power of the God of the sun. I know there must be a power who set these forces in motion. I want to know that power. He wanted to go beyond the mystery schools to the direct experience of knowing God. In the desert place, as he waited after saying this, a man comes walking to him across the desert. 
Now, if you want to take that literally, uh, it gets very interesting. If, if Abram is out in the middle of the desert somewhere, and some guy without a caravan, think about it, one guy alone walking across the desert for how many miles, we don't know. But it would not be possible if that were a human to survive. But this single man comes walking across the desert, and Abram knows when he sees this man, no provisions, no camels, no donkeys, carrying nothing with him, he knows that this is no ordinary man. And he refers to him, he introduces himself. The man introduces himself to Abraham, Abram. But Abram had already, seeing this man coming over the horizon and coming toward him, he had already gathered what he had. Now, what did this man have? Let's look at Abraham for a moment and see who this guy was encamped in the desert, who had moved from Chaldea to Egypt and then into a desert place. Abraham was very well equipped for being in the desert. He had more than one wife. He had 300 concubines. Now what that means is he had 300 women who were there not to be his wives, but simply to bear his children because his survival as a tribe in a desert country depended upon having hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in his family. So he had 300 women to give birth to children for him. That's what they were for. And he had an army, a well-equipped army. I mean, a real army. Saddam Hussein would be jealous. Um, he had donkeys, he had camels, he had herds of sheep. We're talking about a moving city, a city that moved from Chaldea to Egypt, then back into the desert. And with this man with thousands of sheep and goats and camels, he goes immediately to his, uh, his community structure, his governmental structure, and he literally had one. Just Abraham and his family, he has a government. He goes to his government leaders and he said, pick out the best one-tenth of whatever you have. So those who were in care of the camels brought the best tenth of the camels to one place. One-tenth of all his sheep, one-tenth of all his goats, one-tenth of everything else that he owned, including gold, silver, whatever it was, he brought it into one place and it was waiting there by the time the king arrived, and he made that gift to Melchizedek there in the desert. One-tenth of everything that he had was put before this man, and then he's before the man on his knees, waiting to receive what this man can tell him about one more thing. He learned the power of the sun. He learned the power of the moon. Now he meets the Prince of Peace. What I want now is peace. I've learned about power. I want to know peace. So Mel Melchizedek did an interesting thing with him. He said, take some bread and break it, and some wine, and let the, let's put these together. Dip your bread in the wine with me. And so your life and mine are entwined in this ceremony of taking a perfect stranger and letting him dip his bread in your family's dish. When he does that, he is automatically a part of your family. To dip from the common pot made that man a part of Abram's family. He immediately initiated Abram, who became now Abraham, and told him, obviously you have a good start already, you're going to be the father of millions and millions of people. They will go literally round the world. They will establish the empire of the Messiah in the world. So he took that communication from 
Melchizedek, he had one wife, uh, which is traditional among the men of that day. He might have a second and third wife, but the first wife, the chosen wife, is the one that he chose. The others are chosen for the blending of families and for peace treaties and this sort of thing. And then the concubines are for producing children. But there is one wife that is the lover and the mate. Or, to say it in another way, Abraham and Sarah are two sides of the same person. Abraham is the learner, the left brain. Sarah is the intuitive mind that listens. And if you read about Sarah in these stories, you find her always when, when, uh, when the angels are talking. And literally this happened. The angels came to sit down and teach Abraham. He needed to learn. So angels came across the desert. He greeted them. They ate together from the common pot. And then Abraham sat in the tent learning from the angels. And Sarah is at the door. We need to know Abraham and Sarah in us. Sarah is always listening. A hint of something that is not said in words. She's the listener within. She absorbs. She never enters into the formality of going into the sanctuary of the temple. She doesn't do that. The man goes in and lights the candles. His is activity. His is to put to work. But she is always listening just outside, just listening for what he can never hear, because she listens with the heart. And the word that means that uh, is interesting, because when you put these words together, the, uh, the ancient Hebrew words, you find out why it's a good thing that those who took the Hebrew out of the Bible and changed it into Greek were not able to do that with the names. Um, wherever you find this L you know that it is a name of God if it is part of someone's name then the rest of their name in some way relates to God so here we have E-L and the name that is that I put before it here is Sama. Sama means to hear with the heart. To hear what? To hear God. To listen to God, not with the ears, but with the heart. To listen inside to God. Now I put this name down so that you could see something about this name. This name means listening at the gatepost. Notice the similarity in um, here she has an initiatory name of Ra in her name. But then she has the syllable that means the listener. I listen to the sun and then this I at the end. The I is written as a Yud which is a symbol for God. So. She could have had E-L at the end, or she can have the Yud at the end of her name. Either one of them means, I listen to God through the sun, but I listen with my heart. So when we <clears throat> read from the Old Testament in particular, it's a little less true in the New Testament, but it's still important. We want to know these things. We want to know landscape features because every one of them is a reference to a state of consciousness. You're either high on the mountaintop in consciousness or even beyond the mountaintop because Moses on the seventh day was carried beyond the top of the mountain through the cloud into the place of the angels. You're in a valley, you're in a low place of consciousness and the worst that you can be in is in the wilderness because the wilderness is simple confusion and uh, and the classic perhaps from the old testament is jacob 
the man who doesn't know, he's the supplanter, he's the doubter, the second son. He finds himself in the wilderness at night with a stone for a pillow. Read what that says. You may have had the experience. When you can't sleep, when you can't figure things out, when you are ready to butt your head against the stones, you are in the wilderness at night with a stone for your pillow, to the dark night of the soul. And when Jacob absolutely gave up in that experience and asked to know, asked to be forgiven, asked to be emptied, admitted that he could do nothing on his own without the source, then he had an experience called the pen, N-I-L, remember L here? He had the Peniel experience. Uh, pay is face. Uh, Netzach uh, meeting and I here again is the Yud, the glyph for God. So the word says where I met God face to face. The Peniel experience. So this is where he came from the darkness into wrestling with the angel wouldn't turn loose until the angel blessed him and then he's released into the Peniel experience. I'm going to go back to uh, the first page that we put up here to give you some things about the Bible and the biggest point that I want to make initially is all of the books of the Bible that you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all of those are Greek words. So they have nothing to do with the Torah. The Torah is written in Hebrew, and all of those books have Hebrew names. What we have here is uh, the book that in Greek is called Genesis. Here it has the Hebrew name, and the, the name written in English, as it's presented here, is Bereshis, and then it has Bereshis written here. Now, I'll put it up here just to break it down and show you something interesting about this, that Torah. Um, notice these letters. I'm going to pass it around so that you can see letters here or you can open it and, uh, and where you find pages of Hebrew. Just look at it there. Actually, this is made easy. That's modern Hebrew. So you might want to look at this text. So what you'll find here is all of these are consonants. All of these letters are consonants. There are no vowels here. And if you look at this text, the consonants are not broken into words. So we have uh, Beth, Resh, Aleph, Shin, Yud, Tov. And we don't know whether this is a whole word. If we put a vowel with it, this would be a word. What might the word be? If there's not a vowel with it, the, the word could be just the letter of the name, which is Beth, which also means a house. Or it could uh, become Bar, which means son, or Ben, which means son. But if this is a word, Let's say, let's say these guys transcribing this <clears throat> didn't know for sure what the text said. Now that's a key to reading ancient Hebrew. You cannot know what the text says unless you already know the text. It is written deliberately that way so that nobody can read the mystery school text without already having been told what it says. But if you know where to break the consonants into syllables, break it into words, give it pronunciation, give it vowels, then you can read it. So ancient Hebrew was only a reminder, and the Torah was memorized by every student of the Torah. They knew it word for word, so they knew exactly what it said. 
But even if somebody from some other mystery school, some other country, learned ancient Hebrew, they wouldn't be able to read the Bible, even though they knew the letters. Because they wouldn't know where the words start, where the punctuation signs go, and where the vowels are. And an interesting thing that um, a teacher of mine showed me many years ago, he said that this word that begins the Bible may be the word Bereshit. If so, it means in the beginning. That's what was written in the Septuagint, which is the first time that the Bible was translated from Hebrew into Greek. In the work of the 70, it was written in the beginning. However, if these are one, two, three, four, five, six words, instead of one word, which it could well be. I mean, you cannot prove that it's one or the other. If it were six words, then the words here are house, um, protector, the shepherd's crook that was used to protect the sheep. And here, the upper and the lower face of God, God looking down upon his son across with what is referred to as either a nail or a mirror. And we'll talk about the mirror in a little bit because that's up there. And this one, this has yud, yud, yud across the top. The letter is shin, and that's the letter of the people, the congregation of Israel. Here is the yud alone. That's a glyph for God himself or for the Christ. And here is a letter that is removed from the Hebrew alphabet. At the time of this ancient text, the tov had that form. Since it looked like a cross, it was removed, and the tov was rewritten in this form so that it wouldn't look like a cross. But let's leave it this way with the cross at the end in the most ancient form and say what this sentence might have said. Might have said, out of the house of God will be a protector. God's son will come to save his people. Maybe that's the first sentence of the Bible. And you can't prove one way or the other whether it is or not, because it says that, and it also says Bereshit. And the way we got to the Bereshit was that when the people of Israel were carried away in captivity in Chaldea. Now, here is this group of people. You, you've got to understand, first of all, they were not a nation in the beginning. Abraham's father was Chaldean. So he, he was not a Jew. Uh, he was Palestinian. He was Semitic. He was from Chaldea. But it only becomes a nation or a race or a people with Abraham who then moves from Chaldea, learning the Chaldean mysteries, into Egypt, learns the Egyptian mysteries, and then they're taken later to Babylon, back to the mystery school of the Chaldees where Daniel is taught again. And what we do is we find this little group of people committed to finding the absolute God we find them being moved all around the world wherever there is another glimpse of another way to see all of God from every direction that we can look at him from. So they looked through the eyes of the Egyptians. They looked through the eyes of the Chaldeans. They looked through the eyes of the Greeks. Um, and wherever they went, they got more and more the picture of what God would turn out to be once they knew him face to face or from their heart in the Peniel experience. Um, Alexander the Great fits into this story in an interesting way. Once the people of Israel had gone to Babylon, had lost their ability to read the ancient Torah because it was outlawed in Babylon, there were enclaves, of course, here and there, secret little groups meeting and keeping alive the ancient language. But there was a small group of people who were not carried away to Babylon. They were called the men of the mountain. They lived at Mount Carmel. They hid in caves. 
so that they would not be taken into captivity, and they operated the Hebrew school of the prophets. They later became a community called the Pregnant Ones, or the Essenes. Alexander the Great conquered the world, accomplished his ambition except for one thing. His father, Philip, wanted Alexander to be an initiate. So he tried to get him into the Greek initiatory schools. He was turned down. He tried to go to the initiatory schools of Chaldea. He was turned down. He went to one after the other, influential people wherever, and then he thought, well, there's one way I can become an initiate before I die, and that is by becoming Pharaoh of Egypt. Now, here's, here's a man who's ruling the whole world, and there's little Egypt down here in the corner. This man wants to be Pharaoh of that little country. Why? When he's controlling the world. He wants to be Pharaoh for just one reason. He wants the initiatory secrets. He wants to know the mysteries. So he declared himself a Pharaoh. And he found out somehow that initiators, uh, initiates, are temple builders, and that's how they display the fact that they are initiates. That's how they prove it. That's their initiation right, is building a temple to proper proportions. So he comes to a temple, which is called the Temple, uh, temple in Man in Luxor, and he begins to build, unfortunately. He builds this ridiculous Roman scallop shell in the middle of the Holy of Holies in the Egyptian temple of Luxor. And that stands as living proof from that day till this, it still exists there, this anomaly that says to all the world by Alexander himself, I am not an issue. Like waving a red flag, I never made it. And he didn't. But he passed on that, that ambition to the Ptolemies who <coughs> turned over Egypt to. He gave Egypt, he carved up the kingdom and gave it to his generals. And uh, Ptolemy the first was the general that he gave Egypt to. Ptolemy also wanted to become a pharaoh initiate, didn't make it. Ptolemy the second said, well, I know they're not telling me the whole story here in Egypt, so what I will do is I'll collect the mystery literature of the whole world. And he sent scholars to every country of the world and told them, if you bring back the mystery teachings of the country that you go to, I will build a school and a library to house your mystery writings. So this is the first university project of this type ever built. And one of the greatest libraries ever assembled was assembled by this man at Alexandria. So he brought the mystery teachings of all nations to Egypt. They were translated into Greek by his scholars. But there was one initiatory teaching that was brought to Egypt that he couldn't get translated, and that was the Torah. He couldn't find anybody in even the high priest. He brought the high priest as his guest from Jerusalem into Egypt and established him in a place called Leontopolis and built there a temple that was far greater than Solomon's temple had been before it was destroyed. But he gave him this great temple and said, I want you to translate the Hebrew mysteries. And the, the priest had to say to him, well, you know, the, the Hebrew I speak is a little more like Aramaic, and I don't know, I, I'm sorry, can't do it. And uh, Ptolemy said, is there anyone who can? And he said, yes, but they won't. And so Ptolemy asked, who are they? And he said, they're the men of the mountain, of uh, the school of the prophets at Carmel. Uh, Carmel, Qumran, and a few other locations. Well, Ptolemy wasn't one to let that sort of thing stand in his way. He sent an army up to get these guys. He imprisoned 70 of them, 70 Essene scholars, who had spent time all day, every day, on skin of an unborn lamb, making these scrolls, and writing the ancient Hebrew, copying the scriptures, and burying, burying them so that they would be preserved for all history. So he knew that these men knew the scriptures. 
that they were capable of interpreting them and so on. But he was scared that they wouldn't do it, that they would make some ridiculous interpretation that wouldn't be correct. So he imprisoned 70 of them in separate prisons scattered throughout Egypt where they could not communicate with each other in any way. And his belief was if all 70 come up with the same translation, then I'll know it's correct. So they translated the ancient Torah into Greek and called their work he called their work the Septuagint, the work of the 70. What he didn't know was that they had both the Torah, the Mishnah, and the Kabbalah. And as Kabbalistic teachers, these rabbis taught things in stories, stories of everyday life. But all their stories were allegories. And so they gave him this collection of their stories, which he was eager to read these wonderful mystical secrets. And, and then he opens them up and he begins to read things like, God loved, Cain, God loved Abel more than he loved Cain, but it doesn't say why. And so he accepted this man's sacrifice and didn't accept that man's sacrifice. And, the, and, and Ptolemy is going, what? And then there's the story of a bald-headed prophet going up into the mountain and children laughing at him because he's bald and he calls she bears out of the mountain and kills all the children. And Ptolemy says, what kind of God is this? And then he runs into the story of the Hebrews at Jericho and their God is telling them, uh, bring down the walls, kill every man, woman, child, and beast, leave not one stone standing on the other, just utter blood and destruction. And Ptolemy at this time is throwing his hands up and saying, I do not understand this Hebrew God. Doesn't sound spiritual to me. And if you read it as he read it, it won't sound spiritual to you either. The Old Testament sounds like a bloodthirsty story of a God who gave this special little group of people who weren't terribly nice anyway, gave them the right to take other people's cities and countries and all of these things. But what Ptolemy didn't know was that behind every one of those stories was woven a truth that was hidden in things like landscape features, mountains, valleys, rivers, streams, oceans, high places, low places, wilderness, city gates, city walls, man-made structures, God-made features, um, the bears, the animal nature within us, the destruction of the walls of Jericho, tearing down your old belief system. There's the walls of Jericho. You go around it seven times, and then you give a shout. Uh, you know anything about the Arsenio Hall hoop? Yes. <laughs> That's what they did at Jericho. You know, marched around it seven times, did the ILC hoot, and the walls came down. If your walls came down, fine, you're an initiate. You've got to kill every man, woman, child, and beast, and all the gold and silver in your treasury, get rid of it. What does that mean? means when you start a new and pure life, absolutely pure and new with God, your major initiation experience, if you bring with you any of the gold, any of the things that you thought, oh, I'm hanging on to this. I mean, this is an old technique. I know, but I know how well this works, so I'm going to bring it with me over into this new life. You brought this gold from the old life into the new life. You contaminated the new life. It is not pure. Leave no belief, man, woman, child, or beast. No actions, no intuitions, no belief systems, no emotional habits. Don't bring your habits, your beliefs, your, um, your insight, even your knowledge from the old world. Don't bring it into this new relationship with God. Plow it under and make of the place a fertile field where everything grows again from the ground up destroy the city gates and the temple walls and the windows and the dwellings in the walls. So that's what these men were writing. They safeguarded the secrets so well that Ptolemy didn't get them and neither did Jerry Falwell. <laughs>
<laughs> so they're protected to this day, but they're also wide open to anyone who will just read just one little line that says, which things are an allegory. An allegory is an extended metaphor, extended from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation. Read it as allegorical writing. An allegory is always a story about yourself, the hero's journey, as it is called by um, Joseph. Joseph Campbell. The hero's journey, your journey, it is your story. And you read about yourself and all of the warring factions in yourself, building cities, tearing them down, fighting for property, all of these things that go on inside you until finally, at the end of all of this, you build a new Jerusalem. It is a place that is called built four square, crystalline structure, which in Chinese is called the square inch within the square foot. The new Jerusalem, whether you read it in China or read it in the Bible, it's there. And then the soul, your heart, becomes the woman the womb in you, married to God, having born his child, having not known man, a virgin. She stands at the end of the book wrapped in a robe of light with her feet resting on the crescent moon, having overcome the ups and downs and the highs and lows of valleys. Resting on the crescent moon, a crown of 12 stars the initiations of the 12 colleges in the University of Life becomes her crown. And she's the same woman that you see in the beginning going into bondage. Her name is written across the sky in three constellations. There is Andromeda, Cassiopeia, and Virgo. She's presented as the woman in chains, the virgin, and then the woman enthroned with a crown of 12 stars. So this divine woman is the heart of man who God loves, wants to impregnate with his child, and then she becomes the queen of the universe. That's the whole Bible, start to finish. <laughs> uh, I want to show you how some of the study Bibles work in case any of you wants to undertake the daunting task of finding what it really says in Hebrew. Uh, there is a way that you can do that with your own Bible, and there are some helps to doing that. What I'd like to do now is uh, take a, a few minutes break, and then David is going to uh, present you uh, a little glimpse of the astrology, astronomy, the numerology of the Bible and how the celestial events far greater than man are talked about just as much as what happens in man. The Bible is a book that talks about the universe itself as the body of God, Adam Kadman. And everything that happens uh, to me happens to the earth, happens to the solar system, happens to the universe, all of these levels are talked about, the four worlds. And David is going to show you how that's indicated in celestial events, some ancient mysteries that are even more mysterious than what we've given you here, um, how these cycles are tied to weather, to climate, to um, astronomical events, and so on, that you'll see all the way through the Bible. I've set up this uh, piece because this is the mummy wrapping of Ptolemy II, the man who translated the Bible into the Septuagint. This is his uh, mummy wrapping in the case thing. If you'd like to look at it, it's real. Let's take the. The last six months, I've been working on 
uh, what I think is a very major important discovery in religion and science and astronomy. And the, the work that I've been studying has to do with the origin of our solar system and what causes religion to be what it is. And the things that I've found out come from a very ancient time, from ancient records, probably as far back as Atlantis, but that showed up in Mesopotamia and among the Hebrews. And in the Bible, it's my belief and my research that the numbers that are used in the Bible are based on astronomy. And they're not necessarily necessarily historical periods of time, although, as Paul said, they may be. It may be God acting out a drama that was acted out at the beginning of our solar system when it was formed. <coughs> Perhaps you've heard of the stories written by the Greeks of the Titans, the celestial battle fought at the beginning of the foundations of our world. And in fact, you find in, in various places in the Bible where it mentions that the Lamb of God was slain before the foundations of the world. In fact, there was a war, and it was the war of the sons of light against the sons of darkness. And you'll find this theme of this war being repeated in uh, other legends, myths, and religions, and throughout the Bible. What, what this is based on is what I'm going to show you here on this chart. This chart here of the sun and the known planets in our solar system, which number nine, is, is only about 50 years old, 60 years old. The last planet was discovered in 1930, it was the planet of Pluto, and it was discovered through mathematical calculations. The scientists reasoned that because there were some uh, movements in the orbit of Neptune, there must be another planet out there. And they discovered this through gravitational <coughs> equations. They also now suppose there is one more planet out there. They, they figure it's a fairly large planet. They don't know where it is. They call it Planet X or the 10th planet. And so this is a recent discovery. And they have yet to identify this 10th planet. This chart here above this one is 6,000 years old. It was drawn by the Sumerians uh, a period between 3500 and 4000 BC. And you'll notice it shows the planets in fairly close scale to what we now know of to be the scale of the planets to one another. Except for the fact that there's one planet that they have in the corner of the picture, which are marked in green, that is not in our solar system. They called it the 12th planet if you include the sun and the moon as stars or planets. In fact, you'll find in ancient legends that they did not know of things as planets. They were just called stars. They were different stars. Um, they may have known them as planets, except the writing doesn't seem to indicate so. The planet that they identified that we are not aware of, they called it Marduk, or the god Marduk, or Nibiru. Nibiru means the planet of the crossing. It may be similar to a word which is used for Hebrew, which is Habiru. It's the Hebrew word called Habiru. It means the wandering people, the wandering nomads. Habiru is H-A-B-A-R-U. This up here, Nibiru is N-I-B-I-R-U. Nibiru, planet of the crossing. Many ancient legends describe our world being created and then destroyed after a certain period of time. In fact, some of you may be aware of the Hopi legends where they describe four worlds. In Kabbalah, they have something called the four worlds of Kabbalah. And the ancients described the very first time the Golden Age. In fact, the Chinese describe it as a golden age where men lived for a thousand years, as is described in the Bible of the first patriarchs. They lived 
well into their late 900s. Uh, nice ripe old age. Then man declined, there was a catastrophe, the world was destroyed, and then another world formed. And slowly men became um, less in age. You'll find that patriarchs such as Abraham were no longer living 900 years old, but were living 175. And then finally, Moses was down to 120. And now man typically, typically lives, as the Bible says, three score and 10 years, 70 years. That's what's, what an average man might live. And this has proceeded through four periods of destructions, which are in recorded history, our recorded history. Well, what does that have to do with Marduk? The Sumerians believe that there was this war in the beginning of time, and this wandering planet, which they called um, the water monster, was made primarily of water and lots of rock, I'm sure. And they described that this wanderer came from outer space, crossed into our solar system retrograde. The other planets go in a counterclockwise motion. Retrograde is a clockwise motion into our solar system, where it confronted a planet called Tiamat. Tiamat was in the place where our asteroid belt now is. Are you familiar with our solar system? We have Mercury, Venus, Earth, and our moon, Mars, the, so the asteroid belt, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, nine planets. This, this area would be in orbit of what may have been a tenth planet, but it is said that this wanderer crossed the path of the orbit of this planet called Tiamat. They collided. As a result, the planet was cleaved. The cleaved planet, in fact, is where the name Gaia, or Earth, comes from. It means cleaved. One half of it was destroyed and broke up into an asteroid belt, and the other half was knocked out of orbit and became what we know now called Earth. <coughs> and what was left here was the asteroid belt and then the Earth. There's a lot to the story. It includes why the Earth has a very large moon, which is very unusual, and, and such things like that, which I won't go into detail. This is not the purpose of today's talk. But anyway, this planet continued on its way out of the solar system, but like any comet, it returns because it is connected with the force field or the gravitational pull of our sun. So this, this uh, wandering planet seems to return every so often. And part of my research is finding out the period of this return. Now, do we find the story in the Bible? It, is, it seems to be so. It mentions in the second day of creation that God created a firmament in the heavens. And the word used for firmament was rakia. It's a Hebrew word. And it describes something that is called a hammered out bracelet. A bracelet is something that's circular. What I feel this believes, and another author called uh, Zachary uh, Shiskin, Shiskin, who's a Russian uh, researcher of Sumerian um, cosmology, that this asteroid was the firmament. And if you read, it says in Genesis that this firmament was set in the heavens to divide the waters from the waters. You know, what scientists and astronomers today describe the solar system, they describe the inner solar system that's separated by the asteroid belt and then the outer solar system. That's how they separate the solar system today. And what they discovered recently, as recent as last year from the Voyager 2 spacecraft, they discovered that all of the outer planets are made of water, lots of water, thousands of miles deep filled with water. Now, how could that be? The internal heat of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune uh, tend to keep water liquid in, inside the planet. On the, crust, on the crust, it may be ice, 
mixed with rocks, but there's lots of water out there. So there seems to be some scientific basis. Why, why would the ancient rock de describe outer space as dividing the waters from the waters? There seems to be something to that. They knew something. And it describes this bracelet as being a word called shamayim. Shamayim means the heavens. That God set the heavens and the sky to divide the waters from the waters. And the story goes on from there. But what I want to talk about today in this creation story is the appearance again and again of certain numbers. Numbers that are very strange that they should be repeated so many times, not only in the Bible but in other scriptures especially the number six. Six is a number that the Sumerians use as the basis for their counting system. They counted one through 60, and it ended there. It was a basis. completely empty space and we could we could because the mind is bicameral by nature thinks in terms of duality we would say oh there is no thing here because we can look at well, uh, well I would put a couch there and I would put a dresser over there and I would put a piano over there now we have another term that we can't actually talk about it so talking about it cancels it we have the term that is referred to as nothing which is not a term that the human mind can comprehend. Is everybody with me? We can't comprehend nothing because we have nothing to compare nothing to. Now the interesting thing is that because we have a free will, one of the things that the human race has tried to do is still trying to do each one of us in this room is still trying to do it consciously or unconsciously because it is inherent within us and that is we are trying to figure out what nothing is. You're with me again. Have you ever caught yourself trying to do that? You can't do it because the only way to do it is to compare it to something and then you have something. Now, we're not playing the game on words. What I'm trying to lead you into is sacred numbers as principles. Meaning, for example, one plus one never equals two. One is one. Are you with me? So as we do this today, we are not counting. So what I like to tell people is if you can do it, disengage your mind and open your heart. And we might just take a moment and become quiet and do that. Because the heart can understand, the mind can only compare concepts. So let's all take just a minute, close our eyes if you want, center yourself, and literally open the heart for understanding.
Now, part of where the ribbons apply is life expresses itself in wavelengths, and wavelengths express themselves in patterns. And that's a little bit of what we have there on the table. Okay? Their wavelengths in that ribbon forms itself into a pattern. And as the pattern folds and unfolds, it is life itself. Now, let's try, in, in working with numbers, you can, and you can see through the page, we have 1 through 10, which is what Stephen was talking about. But we also, it is important to deal with the zero. Zero is considered to be a sacred number. And take everything you've ever studied, by the way, about numerology, and set it aside for a minute, because this is also not the numerology you, you would buy a numerology book in the bookstore to do numerology. And by the way, if you're into numerology and you want to do a true explanation of your name through numbers, you have to convert your name to Hebrew or Greek. The English alphabet is not based on numbers, and therefore, it, it, even though it looks like it really relates and it comes very close, you can't do your name with numerologies using an alphabet that is not based on numbers. Means yes. You have to change the name to a Hebrew name. Yeah, you can change it to a Hebrew name or you can find the corresponding name. If you have a corresponding name in Hebrew. Not all English names do. We want to look at, again a little bit at what Stephen was sharing with us last night about the blank piece of paper and then the dot. The concept that we want to get clear is nothing or non-existence did not give birth to the one. And I want to say that again. Nothing or non-existence did not give birth to the one. The one gave birth to non-existence. Is there anybody with me on that? If you're trying to do this with your mind, I'll remind you again that your mind cannot work this way. It is not a matter of non-existence giving birth to the one. It is a matter of the one giving birth to non-existence. Now, the reason that is is because we like to talk about the beginning. OK? Do understand that when we talk about life and existence, there is no beginning. It is what is. And because it is what is, it gives birth to what is not automatically. Okay? So the one, when one expresses itself, the only way you can know that one has expressed itself is to compare it to what it is not. And that is your nothing. Does that help get clear about one gave birth to nothing, nothing did not give birth to the one? Okay? We got a couple hours of this, so stay with me if, you're, if you think you're confused already. I have a nice example. Okay. What's that? I learned it in Harvard, it came in my mind. We have paper, but it is this one. This part, I do If this part gives birth, on these two parts. Okay. That may be where we're going. Let's see if it fits. Because <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what you got. I'm not familiar with, with the, the form or the, the pattern. So we have the one, or we have that which is, or we have God, or we have life, or we have light, or we have love. All those terms are interchangeable. Life, love, light, source. They're all the same thing. So there is the one that expresses itself. Okay? Automatically, if one expresses itself, then two automatically comes into the picture. So there is what is, and there is what isn't. Now, if we were in India studying this, they would tell you there is what is, and there is illusion. Okay? So the one 
automatically, when it expresses, it automatically gives birth to two. So we have what is and we have what isn't. Now the attempt to describe or define or identify with what isn't way back in history is what caused the human, the human race to put a cleavage down the middle of the brain. That was the cause of the divided consciousness or the two hemispheres of the brain. Trying to, instead of using what isn't as a reference point to what is, we started trying to give a name to and describe what isn't. And that created bicameral thinking. And what we've been trying to do ever since then is one or two things. We've been trying to maintain that approach, meaning here is what is, and let me see if I can give meaning to what isn't. Those of us who try to maintain that approach have, in, have invented a concept that is called um, endarkenment. Remember, some people know from the seminary program, that's a word I made up a few years ago, and it's now a real word. <laughs> there is enlightenment and there is endarkenment. En endarkenment is the attempt to take what isn't and make it something. Enlightenment, in the simplicity of enlightenment, all you have to know to be absolutely enlightened is to know that one is one and that's what is. Okay? But because there is one, automatically we have two. All right? Now, in ancient studies of numbers, and I don't want to quote this and not, not have it right for you, it might have been the Greeks. Two was never used, never mentioned, never talk, talked about, because it was considered to be an evil number. The way they came to that conclusion is that because if one expresses, it gives birth to two because if one expresses repeating myself, there is that which expressed and then there is that which is not. It was considered an evil number because it was, consi it was considered the beginning of separation or unchecked, and I'll explain what unchecked means, it's called the fall in the Garden of Eden duality. Okay? However, because one gives birth, which automatically gives birth to what isn't, or duality, then there is the third or the trinity, which is the three. So, automatically, if there is one, there becomes what is, what isn't, in the relationship between it. So, in sacred geometry or in sacred numbers, we are not counting and we're not dealing with numbers yet, we're dealing with principles. We don't even get to numbers until we get to four. And we'll explain that because we're going to do sculpting a life. And if you do this carefully, you'll, you'll see today where you are in sculpting your life. Okay? Yes? Is three the relationship between one, two, and three, or just the relationship between one and two? It's, it's both, both and, and you've got the right word. Three is relationship, okay? Now, to make this more personal in our everyday life, because the one expresses and the two is automatic because it is what the one is not, all pain in life, all pain comes out of stopping at the two and not letting it automatically go to the three. Does that make sense to everybody the way I said that? That's where all pain comes from, meaning resistance. For example, the way the master described this principle, he did it in just a few words, and it may be one of his most misunderstood phrases because it was done in so few words. Everything I just said and everything I will say about these three principles, the Master said in this one phrase, love thy enemy. Now what he said is, if you 
will love your enemy, you are automatically back to wholeness. <coughs> you, get, you get the sense of what the Master was trying to tell us? <coughs> if you hold your enemy at a distance from you, then you are, number one, maintaining the belief that there is such a thing as duality and that that duality is real. So, to make it more personal, if there is somebody in your life that you don't like and you are refusing to reconcile or, as the gentleman said, relate a relationship with that person, then you are stuck in this duality, which is the only way you can experience pain. Life will naturally go to the three. What that says is, to say it in another way, is all things relate. Naturally do they relate. Unless we try to stop the relationship. The stopping of the relationship comes from the fact that we bought into trying to make what isn't a what is. We have a mind of duality. The mind compares, and when the mind compares, it compares in terms of right or wrong. Now, in order to have a right, you have to have a wrong. Are you with me? There's no such thing as a right without a wrong. There's no such thing with a wrong without a right. And you can prove that to yourself. We do it as individuals. We do it as countries. We do it as nations. We do it in politics. We do it in religion. The Catholic religion, the way they tell you that they are the right religion, and really get this point, the way the Catholic religion and many, I'm just picking on that particular one right this minute. The way they tell you they are the right religion is by telling you what is wrong with other religions. Are you following me? That's, that's this right here. Because at the core of all religion is truth. And the other interesting thing, at the core of every religion ever recorded on this planet, including voodoo, is this trinity. It's not just from Christianity. The Trinity is in all religions. The, because if there is one, there will be three. In principle. But yes. Does that mean that every even number is negative? Um, not, not negative. But I mean, it has a negative connotation until it gets to the next step. Um, well, it has. It, it's either active or passive. Let's use that instead of negative. All right. Okay. So all your, your, um, let me make sure I get this right. All your, we didn't put that on the chart, did we? The active and the passive? Let me check in there before I, before I quote it, okay? Um, but every number is either an act or it's passive or it's the state, or it's expressive, right. okay? But the, in other words, what I'm asking is that in that form, it's not complete. Every time you have a, an, an even number, it's not a complete uh, quality? Well, let's, let, let's answer that as we go along. Can we put this in, in dialectic terms? Okay. You have a principle, a thesis. It implies, induces, sets up its opposite, the antithesis. Then from the interaction of these two, they forces it to go into a new dimension. And the synthesis well, then is something entirely new. It's an evolution here. And okay. Then, that synthesis in turn becomes the principle which sets up its opposite and so on. So you get a continuous evolution from the thesis synthesis and synthesis. Okay, if we're used it in, in what we're lecturing on this afternoon, that works if we also say that the one is complete within itself, it is all there is, it is all there ever will be. Pardon me? Yeah, I think that's one is one and all one and one shall be Exactly. Okay. However, the one had a desire to express and the one had a desire for companionship. And that's where we come into the picture. We are the companion that co creates with the creator, the source of life, okay? So just keep in mind that nothing did not give birth to the one. The one 
gave birth to the nothing concept. And we don't want to play around with that too much more because you can't. The mind get lo gets lost in it. So one of the first things to do in life is look at what you have in your life that is, I call it stiff-armed in this lecture. What am I holding apart from me saying I am better, I am different, I am more, I am less? All right? And this is one of the biggest traps because a lot of us do this with God. It's not so much today as it was even a few years ago. If you, if you said to somebody, where is God, they would point. You see what you've got when you ask where God is and you point away from yourself? You have the duality. All right? It is the belief in duality that is the source of all pain on this planet. This belief of separation is the source of all pain, without exception. It's the source of all war. It's the source of all crime. The belief that the two is separate from the one. Yes? Do you say that as absolute truth, or do you say that it's one source who gives that information? I lost you. Uh, do, uh, do you say, um, um, what you say is that your absolute truth or uh, is it only a source who gives that explanation? It's, it, that the cause of all pain is duality? Yeah. That's absolute truth. Because pain is a result of resistance. Yes, that can be. But, right. um, one and two can have also other function, and then it works positive. Say that again. You, you can also see you need to have the two to get the energy to remove to the three. So exactly. Then it is helpful. Exactly. Exactly. It, it, if, if it moves. Yeah, it moves from resistance to opportunity. Right. Okay. So that sounds different by what you say at first. Okay. It can be negative, it can also be an opportunity. Right. It's only negative if we try to make it what it is not. Yeah. Okay? Because it will automatically go to the three. So what this is telling us is life and all expressions of life are automatically in love with each other. Now, the, the correct way to say that is life in all expressions of life is automatically in love with itself. Did you catch the two ways I've said it? Life in all expressions of life is automatically in love with itself and automatically knows itself to be the expression. Okay, so any questions on where we've gone so far? All right, and you understand what the master was doing when he said, Love thy enemy. If you love thy enemy, you have no enemy. The master also said, Resist not. And that statement applies to the one in the duality or the two. Okay, so what the Egyptians used to say is, the two unchecked is the fall in the Garden of Eden. Do you understand what that means? Unchecked, it's the fall. If left alone, it is not because it automatically becomes the three. So we have one giving birth to non-existence as a reference to what is not. Okay? Now, you've all heard Paul do the lecture of there is life, love, light, good, and then there is fear, darkness, evil, and so forth. If you can get what we're talking about here in principle, then hopefully you want, you're, you're hearing me at the same time when I say there is no such thing as death, darkness, or evil. It does not exist. And its only purpose, and this sounds like I'm contradicting myself, because it is a paradox. Some of the stuff we're trying to talk about in itself is a contradiction of terms, because what we're actually talking about is what's known as positive negation. Those two words are a contradiction of terms, and yet it's the only way to describe it. All right? So if you can get the clear picture that death, fear, and evil are 
what isn't, and the only purpose they have is a reference for what is. So darkness, its only purpose is to be a reference for light. Unless you buy into the darkness. So what I have just said in another way is all lessons of fear that we have to overcome, we have to create it in order to, in order to have it there to overcome it. And let me say that again, because this one is, is really interesting. If you, if you get this, you can go home, you're done. All lessons that we have that are evolved around evil, darkness, fear, we have to create it, give it our life, to give it life, and then we try to overcome it. You get the paradox I'm giving you? Of all the studying we've done, even in the seminary program, of lessons and initiations, the fact is, if you understand the one, the two, the three, there aren't any. Are you with me? There are really no lessons. We create our lessons, and then we try to overcome them. Yes? Here, put this in the context of what we're saying here. The Master said, love thy enemy. Right. Uh, all pain is resistance. That is my enemy. Right. I must love, uh, embrace my resistance. Right. That puts me in relationship. When I resist my pain, my illness, or whatever, when I'm resisting it, duality. I'm staying in the duality. Right, and you're staying in Making resistance. Making it real. And that's where the pain comes from. Making it real. Okay? So again, I want to just redo one statement that's really interesting. In order to, in order to overcome evil, you have to create it, imaginary, fantasy, and then try to overcome it. And this is a Sunday service I've been doing, and I've done them mainly only in Canada. We talk about the master overcoming evil. I believe in the power of new thought. He didn't overcome evil. He didn't believe in it. Can you see the difference? What would be the difference in your life today if you spent the rest of your life trying to overcome evil and become good enough to get to heaven, or you just decided there is no evil. All life relates in harmony, if I will let it. Or, what's the difference between trying to overcome death versus there is no death? And this is the, the simple truth that is so simple that it's very difficult to get the lesson. The master did not believe in evil, so he didn't have to overcome it. Yes? Yeah, I can see a pitfall if someone says, I don't want to love my pain or love my illness because that would increase it. But what you're saying is not that simple. I think from the second thing you said, it's embracing it, as Richard said. Uh, doesn't mean loving it in a conventional sense. It means looking beyond it. So going, that you're not, not loving your pain, you're just not doing your pain. It's looking beyond it, or it's going through it, or it's going beyond it. In, in the truest sense of the term, as best as we can do, this is a difficult part of this lecture because words don't work, especially the English language. If you love your pain, if you love, okay, your, your worst lesson, your hardest things in life, if you will love them, you don't have them anymore. It is it's a paradox. It has no duality. Pardon me? It has no duality. It has no duality. That makes more sense. Okay. It's saying that it's not existent. Because fear and death do not have a duality for us. Um, if we don't recognize that, then their existence is moot. It's, exactly. It's existence in and of itself in the oneness without duality and it's all existence. Death is existence and life is existence and 
we're well, just creating our own pain, it's existence, and it's all the same thing. And it's illusion because we're co-creators. The fact is, there is life, and that's all there is, period. So death does not exist. Our, we can our... fantasize about it, but we can't create it. So we're creating it, but we are creating it to get over it. We, well, it's an illusion. So it's getting over it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Very good. Very good point. And okay. some of us create these big things to get over, and there's an interesting thing. The larger the thing is we create to get over, the more we make sure everybody knows how big it is and how big the lesson is and how hard it is. And have you ever noticed that until I've made sure all of you know how hard my lesson is, I'm not going to let it go. You see? <laughs> yes. About its relevance to karma then. To karma? Yeah. Explain the emotion yeah. of time. Karma. 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 Yeah. But dealing with past lives and working through the experiences. That's what, in relation to the Kabbalah tree, that what we're talking about is what karma, that's what karma is. Karma is, in the Kabbalah that Stephen had drawn for us yesterday, karma is starting at the bottom of the tree and bouncing from pillar to pillar trying to learn the lessons going back and forth. And there's an interesting question that can be asked. Can you get there through karma, through, through the path of karma? And it's a question that I, I don't want to try and answer. But it is an interesting question that has come up. Can you ever get there? Because we've been at this for billions of years. Okay? Karma is taking that approach. The center pillar is what's known as the law of grace which dissolves all karma. All that really means is it wipes away illusion. And I realize that I cannot become what I am. Did everybody get that? We can't become what we already are. We can resist expressing what we are due to numerous types of beliefs or paradigms or ideas. Um, And if we resist expressing what we are, then, we, then we, we're, we're doing this resistance, painful, duality thing. But we can't become what we are. So learning is actually remembering. What we so often call learning is actually remembering what is. Why are we doing it? Well, I can answer that in a minute. Because it's a 15-minute lecture. So yeah. you can't become what you are. You can't also change who you are. Yes. Can I learn who you are? We can remember who we are. Okay. Can you give an actual experience of having that happen to you? Remembering? No. Your one, two, three thing. Um, in other words, can you say something in a, in a way that... Um, something that we could understand in, in, in a, an experiential way that you have experienced where you have gotten out from the one, two thing and gone to, allowed it to be three. Allowed it to be three. And there, or, or whatever that is. Um, Let it flow. All right, don't know the usual. My wife's here. <laughs> no, never mind. All right, then can think of somebody else's. That's the, that's Has anybody ever told you a story? Um, what if you looked at one as life expressing itself, and two is the result, where we usually get stuck in the result anyway, and three is acceptance of what is? And you it's can, like, you, you know, I'm stuck direction. in two, I get sick, you know, I get in that, you know, stuck in two, and then when I accepted what was, I mean, then you come up and out of it, and you're all right, and life goes on until you. Right. What, what she's saying is, what's an example of a major lesson that gets us stuck in this duality game? Okay, how about a little lesson? Of I will not accept that. Um, well, one lesson for me, then, for example, was my failing the first, third, fifth grade, dropping out of school in the ninth, believing I couldn't learn, and maintaining that, and being stuck there. 
until I discovered that I can learn what I want to learn. And that was bringing it back to a relationship that worked for me. Okay? Do you have an example? Well, being stuck at two uh, is our ego identity. Right. And we have to surrender that to get the three, but we feel that annihilation is involved in surrendering that. Exactly. And that keeps us in this recycling. Pattern. And that's another part of the illusion. It's another part of the resistance. Okay? Yes. I was thinking a little bit about the left side of the brain, the child probably in you versus the guardian. And maybe that's like two separate, you know, and then when you get to some kind of harmony, and yet, you meet that third, and you have a relationship. Like when you can use that example, the child and the parent, that is also that also can be used here. And when you reconcile the relationship between the child and the parent, if you truly reconcile it, you'll know it because you have become enlightened. And what you will discover is there's only one. There really isn't two. Okay. There's only the one. All right? Now, as far as what your question was, pardon me? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Why is this happening? In the beginning, and only God knows when that was. Now, not the beginning of the one, but in the beginning, at that moment in time, well, actually, there wasn't any time then either. <laughs> so, at some point, God expressed. And when God expressed, He expressed because He wanted companionship, He wanted expression, and He wanted co-creation. Okay? So, out of the mouth of God comes all of us. We describe that in the fellowship as diamonds. Okay? Now, these diamonds are connected to the mouth of God, if you will, by a golden thread. Okay? And as we go through bouncing between the two pillars and doing the karma thing, and or lining up in the middle pillar, which is grace, which dissolves all karma, or overrides all karma, as we're doing all that, we go in and out of each other's lives. For an example, this couple who's come from uh, Australia, you've just come into the lives of X amount of these diamonds in your diamonds, and you have a golden thread, okay? And you, while you're here, you will weave in and out of our lives, and we'll weave in and out of your lives, okay? All this weaving is weaving what's known as the tapestry of life, as these threads weave. And the only way you can draw it is thousands of diamonds of beings that God expressed. But now on the heart level, see if you can hear what I'm, what I'm saying. Some of these diamonds forgot who they were or forgot where they came from. There was one of these diamonds that never for one moment forgot true identity, true nature. That diamond is known as, one of the names for that diamond is Christ. Okay? And that particular diamond said to God, I will follow every thread to the end to where the diamond is and cause that diamond to remember their true identity. And in the following of every thread, Christ, our living love, is taking the knots out of the tapestry. The bad knots. Because tapestries have knots. But back to the reason, if this is working, if you're hearing what I'm saying about this, when our life experience is over, what we will present to God as our gift to God for the experience of experience is this tapestry that we have woven. Can you follow that story? We are weaving a tapestry, and that's the purpose. That's what's happening, the co-creation which will get clearer as we, we go through sculpting a life. So let's jump a little bit and see if we can keep from getting confused. 
what we're going to do here is look at sculpting a life with numbers. Uh, I have one question. When that happens, then you have to first be the one. When what happens? When you weave uh, your waves and make connection with other waves, mm -hmm. then before you can do that, then you have first to be one. Right. Exactly. Then it happens. In other ways, then you just uh, you, you do nothing. You may build up only illusions. Right. Mm -hmm. As and some teachers say, there is the point in enlightenment when you look at God and you say, up your divine bucket. <laughs> because you realize that which isn't, isn't. And that which is, is. The only person that I know in recorded history who lived an entire life amongst humanity, not in a cave, who lived the life of what is, is, was Jesus, the master of masters. He never bought into what isn't. Even referred to Satan as the son of God. Okay? If you study the Bible, you'll discover that when he met Satan in the desert, he referred to Satan as a child of God, to use the correct term. Okay? What is, is. All the illusion and so forth is believing in duality. The believing in duality causes the mind to think in duality. Okay? And that's why the mind cannot understand. It's why I said, use the heart. The mind cannot even understand a mathematical formula. If you ever taken a test and you're sitting there and you've got that one last question and you're thinking if I could just get this and all you can feel it here when the answer comes. Does everybody know that feeling I'm talking about? The heart understand, the mind compares information. Okay? Enlightenment is bridging that gap so the mind no longer thinks in terms of duality. It thinks in oneness another experience that the master had. When the master looked at humanity, he saw himself. He saw the only child God ever had. Even though there were five and a half billion of them, he saw the only child who God had and whom he is well pleased in everything that he saw. Okay? Now, <clears throat> I haven't done this lecture in about six months, so bear with me. But, go through it yourselves because what you're going to discover is that you are someplace along, you are, you are at one of these principles or you are at one of these stages in your life. Okay? We start out with the sculpture. We're going to do this as if we are, we are sculptures. So pretend like you're either working with clay or you're, you're sculpting you're sculpting a block of wood, okay? We start out with the sculpture, and we start out with unity, okay? Then you have before you a block of wood, which gives you polarity. There is you, the sculpture, and there is the block of wood. Or, to say that another way, there is you, the co-creator, and there is your perception of what life is. I'm, I'll keep going back and forth if it doesn't get too confusing for us. Okay? So we have this, we have our sculpture, our us, the co-creator, we have unity. When someone sets the block of wood in front of you, you have your block of wood And then you have polarity. There is me and there is the block of wood. Now, a question to be asked about all sculptures or people who work with clay or about you, the co-creator in life, is does the sculpture inspire the block of wood to become a statue or does the statue inspire the sculpture? Are you with me? Mm -hmm. What the sculpture, what most sculptures will do is they will look at the block of wood and maybe turn it to all angles and if they decide it's the right block of wood, the polarity ends and that produces inspiration. Does everybody follow that? Okay? 
that produces inspiration because the, the sculpture has a relationship with the block of wood. Now we're doing this only positively. Let's take our lives. It is sad that a lot of humans, as the co-creator, look at life, have an interpretation that they don't like, and therefore they are not inspired to relate to life. Are you with me on that? If we believe it or not, the average human being spends an entire lifetime resisting life. Resisting what is, rather than what is, is. Okay? Or resisting parts of self. Alright? It's why, where do children and adults come from who don't have self-worth or self-esteem? It comes from being a co-creator, having a paradigm or belief about what life is, and therefore not being inspired, not relating to it, trying to resist it, or trying to deny what is. Okay? Now, when we come to, as Pythagoras says, now that we've come to four, we're dealing with numbers. The reason he said that numbers start with four is because you can't have one without three. So this is a unit. It's the trinity. All right? So num we don't start counting at four, but four is our first number. Okay? And four is the statue or it is substance or substantiality, okay? It is not necessarily what you could kick your foot on and stub your toe. Is everybody with me on that? Let me also add a third way of describing this and let me know if it's getting too confusing. There's you, we're going to cook dinner we open the refrigerator, it's full of food, but that doesn't tell us what the dinner's going to be. Do you understand my point? We don't have the dinner yet. We've just opened the refrigerator. We don't know what the dinner is going to be yet. Okay? There was something else I wanted to say here. Um, Well, let me just say it this way, and unless, because the other thought went through and it's not coming back. If you can reconcile the two, you will discover that life is automatically inspiration. It's automatic. If we have to inspire ourselves, if we have to find artificial ways of getting inspired, then we are stuck at the two. Are you with me? It is our beliefs or our paradigms about what life is that sticks us at two. Life is automatic an automatically an inspiration. Okay? In life constantly, it is the natural law of life to expand its boundaries. Okay? That's the natural law of life. Always wanting to expand its boundaries to become more to express more, okay? And this is where illness comes from. Most illnesses are a result of trying to stop that natural drive of expression. And as we try to hold that in, we create arthritis and cancer and numerous different diseases, okay? Because of the resistance. So we get to principle four, oh, for the females in the group. Two is feminine. Three is masculine, so the feminine expressed before the masculine. Isn't that interesting? All right, so anybody who's in woman's lib and you need an extra mm for your talks, because the one is neither masculine or feminine, or it is both, but then again, we all are. The reason that Jesus often used, you know, in the New Age movement, the way we pray now, it's Father, Mother, God. 
And then there's Father, Mother, God, Earth, John, you know, we, all these gods. Jesus always referred to God as the Father only because the One is that which gave birth to what is. So it is the Father of all things. Not masculine, but the Father of. Okay? Feminine expressed first, obviously. So masculine had something to express to or express on. Is that clear for everybody? So feminine was the first expression. Two is a feminine number. Three is a masculine number. Okay? Now when we get to four, in working with these principles, it already can get very confusing. I will give you the title of a book if you want to study this in more depth than the time we'll spend this afternoon. This, this is another one of those things we could spend a weekend on this chart. When we get to four, we have to ask ourselves, is the four three and one? Is it two and two? Are you with me? Which, because four is a principle, but the principle is the result of the principle of one and two, or, or two and two, or three and one. And you find Pythagoras made a life of this study. And he did discover God face to face by doing this, by the way. He met God face to face through the principles of numbers. Okay? Five in numbers is the number that relates to life. Okay? So at five, we also have activity. So it is at the principle five that the sculpture would start sculpting. Okay? This is very much like astrology. Oh, this fits right into astrology. Yeah, really. Yes. And it's also very much like Kabbalah. All right? If you remember what Stephen was doing with everything he was doing last night, if you take what Stephen did last night and look at it from the, from the perspective of the Star Wars chronology is only about one person, Luke Skywalker. Everybody else is a part of Luke Skywalker. You following me? Everybody else. Leah was his, was his intuitive side. He was the expressive side. Um, Obi-Wan Kenobi was his intuitive consciousness. Yoda is the master teacher within. All those characters, Darth Vader was the fear. Remember when Stephen was talking about when Yoda, this planet that Yoda was on, this master teacher was on, was a very lush planet, but did Stephen tell you it had a lot, a lot of water on it? Emotion. And there was the cave that Luke entered and he met Darth Vader in the cave. I don't know that Stephen told you for sure when Luke went to, went to enter the cave, he said it feels evil in there. And, and he turned to Yoda and he said, what's in the cave? Now the cave is our life. And the teacher said, only what you take with you. Let me repeat that. Only what you take with you. Because Luke took a fear of Darth Vader, Darth Vader was in the cave. Luke took whatever he met in the cave, he took with him into the cave. Has the, the connection with Plato, uh, with his caves in Lucera? Pardon me? Has that connection with what Plato is saying, the cave in Lucero? I uh, think so. Sure what of, of that. Plato? Plato. 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 Plato, yes. You, your, sh your shadow. Your shadow. As Les does a workshop, embracing your shadow. Okay? But the thing to know about that is you have to create the shadow in order to have one to embrace. You with me on that? You understand what I'm saying? So as we go through life, what is going to our life is that cave that Luke went into. And if you ask your master teacher what's in the cave, the teacher's going to tell you only what you take in there. Only what you take with you. 
If it is love, then it is love. If it is fear, it will be fear. You see? So it's only what you take with you. Okay, we get to principle five, and we move on to the sixth principle. Okay? And this is the framework in which the sculpture is going to do the sculpting, and that is time and space. Okay? So time and space doesn't even come into the picture until you get to the sixth principle of numbers, or the sixth concept. Okay? Now what that tells you is we do not live in time and space. We are time and space. Are you with me? In, in this culture and with the English language, we would say that there's Thomas and there's Eleanor and then there's space between us. That is not the correct way to say it. Eleanor is space and I am space. And there is no thing between us or there is life between us. All right? Let me say that whole thing another way to help you understand it a little clearer. The great pyramids were built with this formula, which means they are time and space, which means we'll, we'll have to blow them up to get rid of them. They will last forever. They, they, they do not exist in time and space. They are time and space getting some blank looks on this one. You need to have the space to get the R. Pardon me? You need to have the space to get R. To get R? Yes. To, you you mm. need both to have space to see each other. When there is no space, you shouldn't see it. Right. Okay. That works. But, and I'm using but intentionally, the pyramids are time and space. They're not built in time and space. We are time and space. Okay? And we only use time and space so we can have individuality for our own unique expression. All right? When you say the pyramids are time and space, you're referring to not the physical man built the pyramid, the, the archetype of the pyramid. I'm referring to that as well, yes. They're, they're built with this formula, which means they're not in time and space, they are time and space. One of the ways to get a handle on... The sacred architecture. 